Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Tim. I'm from the Methanol Institute. Uh, I represent the Methanol Institute in the capacity as a manager for government relations and business development in Asia and Middle East. I would like to welcome all participants to the webinar today. We'll be focusing on methanol fuel cells and uh, I'll give a short introduction and um, then we'll let our speakers do the rest of the work for the day. Um, but before we start, just a couple of things to take note. Participants, you are unmuted, so don't worry about making a noise in the background. We won't be able to hear you. But what you can do if you do have questions is that there is a questions tab on your control panel. So if you click on the drop down menu, uh, please feel free to type in your questions down there. So without further ado, I'll just quickly go through an introduction of the Methanol Institute. Uh, MI was established in 1989. We've been around for more than 30 years right now. And uh, hmm, sorry, just give me one second. Yes. Sorry, everybody. Uh, now, now we're beginning. So as I mentioned, yes, uh, MI was established in 1989. We've been around for more than three, 30 years. Uh, we are the Global Trade Association for the Methanol Industry. We have four offices around the world. We are based in uh, Washington, D.C., Brussels, Beijing, and Singapore. That's where I'm based. And MI is a tiered membership organization. Uh, we have four tiers. The first, tiers, uh, the first tier are members with uh, the biggest uh, methanol production capacities, and this trickles down into uh, other companies that have small capacities. And in tier four, you'd find um, distributors, technology providers, uh, etc. And you'll also find some of our fuel cell companies that are presenting there tonight in tier four. So the work that's done in MI is typically divided into four groups. We have the Marine Fuels Committee, we have the Market Development Committee. The Market Development Committee focuses on different applications to include uh, methanol for cook stoves, methanol for industrial boilers, and the topic of today, which is methanol for in fuel cells. And uh, we have the Product Stewardship Committee, which looks at the safe handling of methanol in a variety of applications. But we also have, uh, lastly, the Global Fuel Blending Committee, which looks at the use of methanol in land transport fuel. So that's my short introduction. Uh, these are our contacts. Uh, feel free to um, take them down. There is a tab in your control panel, which says handouts. And if you click on that, that will lead you to a drop down menu where you can download the slide deck for today. So without further ado, I'll introduce my first speaker. My first speaker is from Denmark. Uh, Matt is from the Blue Wall Technology Company, uh, and uh, he'll be giving his presentation on their experience with the methanol fuel cell. Matt, please. Thank you. Um... And thank you for this uh, opportunity to talk a little bit about methanol fuel cells and uh, Blue World. And I should have the controls now to skip one ahead. There we go. Uh, so methanol fuel cells, as Blue World sees it, consist of a reformer and a higher temperature PEM fuel cell that uses methanol and produces uh, electricity. Uh, most applications, this will be together with a battery pack of some sort or type and this will power a application with electricity. This can be anything from heavy duty to passenger vehicles and in the general genset area. One thing that can be said in common is uh, where you see a diesel engine today, a methanol fuel cell system will be relevant for the future. It will be because of CO2 savings, both using uh, fossil-based methanol, but especially when using uh, renewable produced methanol. Um, the added efficiency of a fuel cell system will give cost savings because you use less fuel, you will use less maintenance for the fuel cell. This is coupled with zero harmful emissions, which means no uh, particulates for the local environment. So Blue World is very focused on the scale of this technology to actually make a significant impact. And this is based on a mass manufacturing of the core elements inside the fuel cell and the fuel cell stack itself. We are now building up a pilot plant, which will be followed by a larger capacity plant uh, of 50,000 units per year. 
the uh, thing that we are focused on as a company is uh, in the bottom, the methanol fuel cell electric vehicle of different types here as a passenger car. And uh, the reason why we focus on this is because the ecosystem of methanol is already existing. So the trade is already existing, the transportation, the ability to store it in a massive scale, and especially the production, both as a biofuel, as a waste fuel, and as an e-fuel from renewables like wind and solar, that ecosystem is already existing. We are basically tapping into it as a consumer of this methanol. The technology track for using methanol in fuel cells, there are, there are many different types. You'll hear some today, some you won't. Um, what Blue World is focused on is high temperature PEM technology, because combining high temperature PEM fuel cells with a methanol reformer gives you some great advantages. You don't have to use energy for evaporating your fuel. You can reuse the waste heat from the fuel cell, and the fuel cell can use the gas reformer directly without cleaning it further from the reformer. Now these things combined makes an efficient technology platform, which is also cost competitive. This gives a product platform consisting of a modular approach. This means several fuel cell stacks for larger applications, single fuel cell stacks for small applications, a fuel or a fuel reformer that can be scaled based on, on that need. It has a high electrical uh, efficiency. A system built with these components is able to use 100% pure methanol as we can condensate the water coming out of the exhaust. So no need for a fuel mix for this kind of system. The start of time is 10 minutes from ambient to operation state, which means you need uh, in most applications this battery to sort of bridge the immediate demand for electricity and the time where you can actually get electricity from the fuel cells and the operation temperature is around 160 degrees. So this is an example on how a methanol fuel cell hybrid system can look like. You have batteries in the back and you have a fuel cell stack with reformers and all of the system components. And basically you are able to put a methanol fuel cell system and a battery pack into the box that uh, used to be a, a battery box for normal battery electric vehicles, uh, making it into a hybrid system. And this is how sort of the hybrid system would look like in its entirety in a skateboard configuration of a vehicle. And it gives both the end user some significant advantages, long range, fast refueling, cost savings, and all of those things. But it also gives the vehicle manufacturer, the OEM, some great opportunities to reuse the existing platforms, both the skateboard type and passenger vehicles, but also the existing hybrid vehicles. Now that means that you're able to basically build on the vehicles you have today with new fuel cell technology. Um, as I said before, uh, both due to startup time of the fuel cell system, but also due to the great benefits of a battery being able to have a hard, high discharge rate, the combination of a battery pack for the peaks and the fuel cell for range is the way you can both optimize the cost of a drivetrain, but also the weight and the size and pretty much everything. So methanol fuel cells, at least uh, how we see it, is a, a combination of batteries and fuel cells. So one thing we are often talking about, talking about uh, fuel cells, uh, is the efficiency of a total system. So coming from renewable electricity onto the vehicle ve wheels. And there's no doubt about it. Pure battery electric vehicles are extremely efficient. And um, that cannot be argued. Methanol fuel cells are as, as efficient as a hydrogen fuel cell. It's much more efficient than a combustion engine um, total efficiency. Um, but you also have to look at the effectiveness of other aspects of having a vehicle. Refueling time, the range of your vehicle, being able to use cabin heating from the fuel cell, weight of the overall drivetrain, how the infrastructure is deployed, the cost of that infrastructure. 
So there are many aspects. And I would say as soon as the benefits from a methanol fuel cell starts to add value, that's when you should look at it. If you can manage with a battery electric platform as it is today, then that's the best platform for you. So what Blue World is focused on for passenger vehicles and many other vehicles is to optimize this by utilizing a hybrid. So using the efficiency of a battery electric drivetrain when possible, and using all the other benefits of a methanol fuel cell when that's possible. So, so that's sort of the combination of the two and, and how we see these two different drivetrains complementing each other. Uh, another important point is the uh, overall air pollution and CO2 emission. Normally, these two are sort of mixed together, but, uh, but we see them a little bit separate. Uh, you can have a low well-to-wheel CO2 emission, uh, but still have air pollution by using biofuels in combustion engines, for example. So what we try to do is focus on a completely clean exhaust for your local environment, and then focus on a well-to-wheel low CO2 emission uh, aspect when using e-fuels or biofuels uh, as the source of the energy for the, um, for the methanol. So, so that's an Im Im important fact. And um, we see that having a net carbon neutrality is a perfect way of doing decarbonization. Um, so, so that's sort of the emission perspective of, of methanol in fuel cells. So if you do a powertrain comparison between vehicles, um, you can see that a methanol uh, fuel cell car has many of the same aspects as a normal combustion engine car has today. Um, the main thing is today it's not on the market. It will come on the market. And what we can see is we will be able to uh, reach uh, roughly the same cost as a combustion engine vehicle uh, in time and in volume. The main benefit of such a vehicle is that the mileage would be much better, meaning you can save if you operate the vehicle. Um, and this means that for applications we are sort of interested in initially is applications where you actually use your vehicle a lot. So that's sort of the comparative scope when you look at a methanol fuel cell vehicle and a combustion engine vehicle or even a battery electric vehicle. So we are not just focused on passenger vehicles. We are also looking very much into other types of vehicles, uh, trucks, buses, vans, and even the maritime applications. As I said in the intro, anywhere you find a diesel engine today is a place where a methanol fuel cell uh, will have a place in the world. Now, one thing there is to be said is if you can manage with an electric bus or an electric uh, ferry being a battery electric bus or battery electric ferry, then that's fine. That should be the technology to use. But every time that you need something more than a pure battery electric variant, a methanol fuel cell can easily be integrated using many of the same components as the battery electric variant. And uh, to wrap it up, um, Blue World is, is, is ready to make a difference by deploying these methanol fuel cell systems into uh, vehicle applications, into uh, all the applications out there where we can make a difference, basically. Today, we are established. We are building up a production. We have a solid order book from some customers. We uh, have room for more customers, and we are basically open for global deployment of this technology. We believe in close partnerships, so, so this is basically what we're all about. And I think that, that concludes my talk. Yes, it does. Thank you, Matt. Um, so what we'll do is that we'll go on to the next presentation. We'll leave uh, Q&A till the end. We've been uh, receiving all your questions and it's been coming in. So uh, yeah, presenters, we've got our work cut out for us. Uh, next up, we have uh, Robert Schluter from Element One. Uh, Robert, um, would you like to give your presentation right now? Excellent. Tim, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to speak at today's uh, Powering the Future webinar. Hello, I'm Rob Schluter. I'm president of Element One Corp. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about using methanol as a transportation fuel 
for fuel cell heavy duty trucks. I'm sorry, uh, control of the, do I have control of the PowerPoint? Okay, Robert, can you try again? No. Does it work now? Uh, no, but I'll just uh, tell you when to go to the next slide. Okay. Okay. So let me give you a little background about Element One Corp. Um, E1 is a global leader in developing small scale to medium scale advanced hydrogen generation systems supporting the fuel cell industry. Uh, we offer solutions in both stationary and mobile uh, solutions. We have a little bit of an interesting business model. Our, our business model really is to support made in country initiatives. And so we develop products and technology to pre-commercial ready. And then we partner with in-country OEMs who provide the manufacturing and the channel to market. Therefore, we're not a, a, a large commercial manufacturer at E1, but we do work with a number of, of large OEMs globally. Next slide, please. And so in a, in a few key markets, um, fuel cell solutions are finally moving to the demonstration phase uh, and are being commercialized um, in the transportation industry. The market knows that the fuel cell solution is commercially ready uh, from a number of different uh, solution providers, whether it be Ballard, Hydrogenics, Power Cell, there's, there's a number of well-established fuel cell companies out there. However, traditional uh, hydrogen solutions are expensive and can approach $16 a kilogram in key markets. This provides resistance to the adoption of the fuel cell vehicles. Sometimes it is known as the hydrogen challenge. Lowering hydrogen's total cost per kilogram is the point of use in driving demand for fuel cell vehicles. Often you'll see that the cost per kilogram is in excess of $12 US, which again is very expensive and, and provides resistance to the adoption of the fuel cell. I propose that E1's methanol to hydrogen generators can solve this hydrogen challenge. Next slide, please. So a couple of different problems. One is the heavy duty vehicle has to store enough compressed hydrogen to achieve the target distance between the refueling. In addition, hydrogen refueling infrastructure is lacking and expensive to build. You know, the solution is to convert the methanol water mix to a high purity hydrogen on board the heavy duty vehicle. Um, this is particularly important for trucks that need a lot of route flexibility. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what a hydrogen generator is. Here are a couple examples. It's really just a completely self-contained machine that converts the, this liquid feedstock to purified hydrogen. You have an electrolyzer which splits water and electricity into hydrogen and oxygen. However, it's got a higher capex and an opex that's driven by the local cost of electricity. And it takes about 15, 55 kilowatts electricity to develop uh, one kilogram of hydrogen. Uh, the next type of solution is a natural gas reformer, which uses methane plus water to react to make um, the hydrogen. It also has a higher capex um, and you need to be where a natural gas pipeline infrastructure exists. So then we get to the methanol reformer. And this is where you're doing a low temperature reforming versus the higher temperature reforming in natural gas. It is much less expensive from a CAPEX perspective, and it also provides the lowest OPEX uh, with supporting infrastructure. Um, very, very attractive to the, the trucking market. Essentially, our technology has the lowest capex and produces the low total cost of hydrogen and requires no supporting infrastructure. Next slide, please. So, a lot of this, when we talk about the uh, the story of E1's technology, really, you're talking about a lot of the benefits of the methanol. So, uh, methanol is a superior a very hydrogen dense transportation fuel. It has a high hydrogen fuel density and you put it right on board the vehicle. 
It's a low cost of fuel with the right technology like E1s and it's available globally. Um, it's a low carbon fuel and it has a renewable future just like renewable hydrogen or renewable natural gas. And it also reduces the safety risk because you're not storing a lot of high pressure hydrogen on board the vehicle. And finally, it's, it's very clean from an exhaust emission standpoint. There's no NOx, there's no SOx, there's no particulate matter. You know, all you need is the right technology on board the vehicle to unlock the hydrogen in the methanol. Next slide, please. So why consider onboard hydrogen generation? Well, you really need to think about in terms of kilowatt hours. Um, if you've got a low kilowatt hour solution, a pure EV solution is superior. So think of very small cars, bikes, things of that nature. As the kilowatt hours grows on the vehicle through cars, then you start looking at a gaseous hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. And then as you go up into the hundreds of kilowatts to megawatt scale, you need a liquid fuel to really provide that hydrogen density aboard the vehicle. Where E1 plays is really in kind of where the, the bus uh, scenario where you need roof flexibility uh, or you've got lots of hills all the way to the class A trucks, trains, and the marine vehicle. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we're really just trying to communicate here is that methanol is a very energy dense uh, hydrogen fuel. And on a volume basis, methanol has almost six times the energy density of compressed hydrogen at 350 bar. As a, this is according to energy.gov here in the United States. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the, the vehicle architecture when you're using E1's technology. So you have a liquid methanol water tank that's gonna be on the truck or the boat or the train. And then you really have our platform where we take that liquid feedstock, we pressurize it in a very compact reactor, we vaporize that fuel and then it hits a catalyst bed and we break it into its component parts, hydrogen, CO and CO2. And then we really have our key proprietary technology, our hydrogen membrane purifier. And through a pressure differential, we provide fuel cell grade hydrogen um, to the fuel cell, who in turn provides electricity to drive the, the power to the wheels. It's a very simple operation, very inexpensive to manufacture, at very good at load following uh, the vehicle as it's going through its mission. And again, if you use a renewable methanol, uh, then it's a zero emission type technology. Next slide, please. So as we look at the specifics of the technology, you know, this is really designed to, to replace hydrogen, compressed hydrogen on board the vehicle. Um, it, uh, the, the feedstock, as I've mentioned, is a mix of methanol and DI water, roughly two thirds, one third. And we can support applications in a single, very compact module from 30 kilowatts all the way up to 300 kilowatts. And it produces a, a very fuel cell grade hydrogen with no uh, CO or CO2. And the target uses for this are heavy duty trucks, buses, trains, and marine vessels. When you look to the right here, you see a system supporting a 50 kilowatt fuel cell on board medium duty vehicle in China that's uh, going through integration currently. Next slide, please. If you look at this uh, same vehicle, here's an illustration where this medium duty vehicle was using compressed hydrogen gas. And again, I'm just kind of showing this to illustrate how much additional range you can get out of the same platform. And this, uh, this platform here, I'd had enough uh, compressed hydrogen supporting the, uh, in this case, a 40 kilowatt fuel cell for 13 hours of operation. And that same volume using our M-series uh, methyl and hydrogen generator, you can get 67 hours of operation out of that vehicle and almost five times the range. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a, a illustration or a picture showing our system and a test stand. This will be shipped to another a truck manufacturer here next week uh, to China. Uh, also for a medium duty uh, application, this one is sized to 60 kilowatts. And I just wanted to show you it's very compact in size, roughly 53 inches high, 50 inches across, 
And the hot box there, which is the key component there, is 60 inches long. The controls uh, actually are wrapped into the vehicle controls on a commercial model, and the balance of plant can be bolted wherever aboard that truck. Next slide, please. So this last year, we were uh, down at a California Fuel Cell Seminar, and we had an opportunity to look at a Class A truck that was uh, um, put together by a Toyota Kenworth partnership. And so in the back of the cab there, they had a very, they kind of a higher than typical cab, um, but within this cab, they had stored, uh, stored hydrogen about 60 kilograms worth, and they estimated their range at 300 miles. Now, if you'd put our system in that same volume there, you'd get a range of a thousand miles using 650 gallons of methanol water mix. Next slide, please. So let's talk about payload and energy density. When you talk to fleets, uh, trucking fleets, what they care about is what is the paid cargo and the ranges they can achieve. And a lot of the Class A trucks, particularly in North America, you need to have these very long ranges, 1,000 miles range is very typical. And if you look to compare diesel fuel versus compressed hydrogen versus E1's technology, uh, this is what you kind of, this is how it affects the different load requirements. So typically it would have a load of about 50,000 pounds that a diesel truck uh, would pull and they'd have a storage of diesel fuel of about 210 gallons. If you go to a compressed hydrogen solution to achieve that same range, you would need 165 kilograms of compressed hydrogen on that, and which takes up about 7,800 liters of space in that vehicle. So you're reducing the space load of that truck as well as the weight load of that truck. Using our systems, um, you essentially save about 60% of the weight, uh, excuse me, 30% uh, of the volume and 60% of the weight equivalent of the compressed hydrogen solution, having a much more uh, payload uh, comparable to the diesel solution. Next slide, please. And so this is really the key slide for the trucking industries that when we're talking to them, it's the fuel cost comparison. So assuming a diesel fuel cost of $3 a gallon for a truck that we just defined there, uh, your, your cost on annual cost would be about $90,000 a year. Using uh, methanol and water as a feedstock and assuming uh, we're producing uh, hydrogen at $4 a ki kilogram uh, using $400 a metric ton for the cost of methanol. You're getting a solution that has $100,000 end of the year fuel cost, very comparable to the diesel fuel solution. If you use compressed hydrogen, assuming $14 a kilogram is at the point of use cost for that truck, you're getting a fuel cost that's more than 3x the time, exceeding $300,000. Uh, for that truck. This is the driving factor that uh, that's going to really propel methanol as a transportation fuel. Next slide, please. So as we, uh, we start to wrap up here, I just wanted to um, uh, provide visibility that our technology can work with any low temperature PEM fuel cell out there. Our systems have been uh, integrated in the stationary markets with, uh, with PEM cells from Horizon, Ballard, Hydrogenics, Intelligent Energy, NADSTEC, it really doesn't matter. Uh, these are great products, fuel cell products. They all need the same type of hydrogen at the same pressure at the stack. And we have uh, an easy pathway of integration to all of these technologies. Next slide, please. So this is our concluding slide here. And this is really what I want you to walk away with. You know, gaseous hydrogen has significant limitations in regards to logistics, to infrastructure, cost, and is really not practical for heavy duty transportation. Liquid methanol, however, is a low carbon fuel. It has a high hydrogen density, um, it's low cost liquid logistics and storage, and it has reduced safety risk versus compressed hydrogen. And it is practical for heavy duty transportations. E1's mobile M-series solutions for heavy-duty transportation supports extended range requirements and allows for a typical vehicle mission and significantly reduces the investment in hydrogen refueling stations. Our products unlocks the benefits of methanol and solves the hydrogen challenge. And when you use renewable methanol, when it comes available on the market in large quantities, now you're driving towards a zero emission sustainable future.
Um, we really believe that our technology will accelerate the adoption of fuel cell power solutions. Thank you very much. And I would welcome your questions either during the panel or afterwards if you want to learn more about our technology. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I'm sorry about that technical issue. Next up, uh, we have a presentation from Palkin. Dr. John Shen is representing Palkin today. Uh, I'm going to try to give him the controls right now and see if we can avoid that issue earlier. Dr. John, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity. Uh, my presentation is uh, Chen, Mr. Chen, have you put the I cannot see my presentation here. Mm -hmm. I, let me see. You might have to alternate okay, tab. Yeah, uh, might be, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you should be able to click on the slides too. Uh, click where? You, sh you should be able to move the slides on your own too. No, move the button. Yep. It's difficult. No, no. It's not working. Okay, this is your first slide. Uh, no, no, I, I, I can you put I'll I'll do it for you then. I'll oh, do it for you. Okay, you know me for me. Okay, okay. okay next slide. I, you know that uh, right now I, I'm t I'm trying talking about uh, is the uh, national fuel uh, fuel cell technology in the Asia market. So next slide. Yeah. So the particularly I'm talking about is in China or India like that. And uh, you know that the, in those countries, right, not pollution is a big problem. And uh, also energy, because those countries that uh, energy is also, resource is also very, uh, you know, uh, limited. So uh, people here are trying to find a new way to, to solve this problem. Next slide. Okay, so, uh, talking about the, the energy history, so why fuel cell and the hydrogen is uh, getting hot and hot in, in this area is because uh, of the energy efficiency and also, uh, you know, the carbon reduction, carbon emission reduction. That's two ways to get the hydrogen fuel cell getting hot and hot. Next slide. Not to... okay. So uh, in China right now, the majority fuel cell uh, technology is using that uh, hydrogen tank, and uh, uh, I mean that the compressed hydrogen tank. But uh, you know that uh, to present it earlier, they already talked about that the hydrogen uh, compressed hydrogen. It is some kind of limitation is because of the cost and the safety issue and the build the hydrogen station uh, is a really tough problem. And uh, so in China that right now there's about uh, uh, several uh, about 50 uh, hydrogen station is built, but uh, those area built is all in the uh, limited really. Uh, uh, far from city to, for a safe reason. Next step. And also compared to those uh, problems uh, in China right now, there's building a, 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 a national or infrastructure is going up because uh, particularly the, the uh, issue is in China right now, Mesino is the uh, uh, biggest production country in China, and 60% uh, uh, of Mesino produced in China because of uh, 18 years ago, Chinese government trying to uh, make the 
coal uh, and clean coal technology. So they start to use convert the coal to methanol. Next. I think this, the problem is here the speed is the Y speed is, is very slow, so I cannot uh, get in time. To, okay, so these two tables uh, tell people that uh, the national uh, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure in China first is 60% uh, uh, of production uh, located in China. Also, in China, all those national feeling uh, station, the regulation standard, all those things is already built up. And so it's uh, easily for people to uh, assess the national, particularly uh, those uh, national as a fuel for, for, for heating, for heat cooking, even right now for the uh, uh, net, uh, uh, internal engine, uh, national is already started up, uh, I mean the boomer. And uh, right now there's uh, 10,000 taxi running in Xi'an uh, city, and also about more than 10 tax, taxi, that's the internal engine, but the uh, national, that's in the Guiyang uh, city. That's only within two years, there's more than uh, 30,000 uh, vehicles running national in the country. So this is just in a very, very short time. And uh, right now, uh, last year, the Chinese government uh, have, uh, 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 with eight ministries, uh, joined together, issued a uh, document, promote people to use national as a fuel. Next. This is... So next, not moving. Okay, so, uh, this is just show people that all those uh, regulation and uh, national fueling station setup uh, uh, policy, all those documenting from government is uh, ready. And uh, in China right now, there's three ways to uh, use national as a fuel, burn directly, um, use national as a heating uh, is in the uh, northern part this uh, countryside is uh, uh, quite available, and also uh, net, uh, uh, internal engine. And the third one is use fuel cell uh, as uh, uh, use national fuel cell, and I will talk about it later. And uh, this table show uh, the people is uh, if you use uh, uh, a new technology, we just listed all those. Uh, a character is, is some kind of, uh, you know, that the limited uh, condition, so it's a limited uh, application. But the uh, national with an analysis, the, all those uh, uh, elements like the, the efficiency, all those, and we found that the national uh, fuel cell is actually, there's a really little, uh, uh, say that, uh, uh, resistant to, to, to commercialize. Next. Okay, can I move the next? Okay. So power can, 
Falcon is actually uh, start a fuel cell business in Vancouver 20 years ago. We uh, we developed the uh, uh, hydrogen technology, fuel cell technology. Started with the e bicycle, then portable one. Then seven years ago, we started in China to develop the uh, national reform the fuel cell technology. And uh, because we found that this way and uh, per kilowatt cost is uh, lowest and it actually uh, is really have an advantage. We use the technology is a high pan fuel cell technology uh, as a blue world similar. And uh, we have two uh, uh, products right now. Move next. The, the first one is a five kilowatt module, and uh, we can uh, put together, stack together uh, as you want. And uh, the second one is a 300 watt uh, portable module. That uh, move ahead, uh, move move the next step. And uh, that two uh, products is already we commercializing in China, and uh, also uh, we. Uh, uh, use that in uh, a different area. So move, 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 move next. And the, the in China, there's another uh, news is because uh, renewable, renewable produce national use solar and recycle the CO2. This is also a big uh, production, uh, uh, I mean, the feed uh, testing facility is built in China and uh, uh, and uh, 1,000 ton capacity is also start built. That is the, the, the renewable methanol production also start in China. Uh, uh, this, uh, okay. Okay. Okay, can we move, move, move further? Next slide. Okay, I want to talk to this, this slide the more specifically because uh, uh, this is a track building Dongfeng. There's uh, four platform uh, built in the same 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 uh, platform is a, a four town track, and uh, they build the diesel. Uh, and also, no, the, the back to back back to the, the uh, and uh, these truck they have four type of fuel. First is uh, diesel, and the second is uh, second is uh, uh, fuel national fuel cell and uh, and also battery also hydrogen. And uh, we run it. These are all tech. okay. Don't no, no, move. move. Uh, 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 sorry, here is because the slider is not catch me catch catch up. So it's 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 automatically moving move on. So I don't know why. Okay, uh, sorry for that. So we we already develop a uh, vehicle. We also develop the uh, UPS, and also we develop the uh, backup power uh, supplies and also we develop a portable all those application is is uh, running now these these, these uh, picture is just show you uh, in a same track uh, we use the methanol fuel cell also use the uh, high pressure uh, compressed hydrogen fuel cell uh, Sorry, because the, 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 the slide is just uh, uh, move on. So, okay, move ahead. What? Okay, yeah, yeah, back to the. So, we just show you the difference here. All the same, almost the same space take up and uh, use methanol fuel cell, we can run it. 500, 500 kilometers and use these three bottles 
and they learn about 350 kilometers. So a big difference, uh, similar, almost similar weight. This is the vehicle we developed the, uh, and okay, this is just the truck to build. Okay, move the next because uh, I sorry. Can you move next? Okay, this is the document we have Chinese government uh, for a uh, reform of national reform fuel cell standard. For a track, uh, this is uh, 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 we have the government build up this uh, standard for 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 vehicle, and uh, this vehicle is the first one in China uh, issue the license to on the street. Can you can officially running on the street? Next. Okay. This is uh, uh, we converted at uh, uh, SUV uh, for the two module to in the back, and uh, this vehicle is an uh, EV version, and uh, we add two module, and then this capacity uh, can be 800 kilometers. We run this vehicle from Shanghai to Beijing, and uh, just one way to to get there. And right now, this vehicle is used as a uh, uh, engineering maintenance vehicle for for telecom industry. Move to the next. Okay, right now we have a, a, a joint project with a local manufacturer, local auto manufacturer, uh, develop a SUV, integrated SUV, use our technology. So, national fuel cell as a fuel, I think, in the Asia and in particular in China, is a potential, big potential application. So, thank you. So. Sorry for 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 the the presenting because I uh, PPT and uh, I cannot catch up on time. Sorry. So uh, I will stop here. Mr. Chen, sorry for the Thank for you, the, Dr. For no worries. I'm sorry about the technical uh, problems. Uh, for people on the call, uh, if you were not able to catch what Dr. John was talking about, uh, feel free to uh, provide your questions mm -hmm. in Q&A. Uh, and uh, what we'll do is we'll try to go through some of his content uh, during Q&A, mm -hmm. where we will not mm -hmm. be encumbered by uh, technical uh, issues. So um, next up, we have uh, Roland Gumpert from uh, Germany who will be presenting on his uh, new fuel cell car. But before we proceed, uh, we would like to uh, play a short video uh, for the audience right now.
Okay, so right now I would like to invite Roland to give his uh, presentation right now. Roland, please. Yeah, thank you, Tim, uh, for your presentation and introduction. It's uh, um, my name is Roland Gumpert, and I want you invite to show our revolutionary driving technology with hydrogen generated from methanol. Once again, this is our car, Natalie. I hope all of you have enough money in the future <laughs> to buy this, maybe. <laughs> Of course, our vision is to use this technology for each car, small or big. And when I start this business with electric cars, then was my, uh, my idea was to build a car which didn't stop when the battery is dead. This is the main thing. The battery is dead. Your electric car which is driven by battery is not, not uh, possible any longer. In normal electric cars, Yes, we do have batteries. Batteries only have a range of 100 to 350 kilometers. And uh, if there is written more, don't trust this. Uh, because there is uh, the aircon, uh, the heating in the winter time and other consumers of electricity. So I have never driven a car which is uh, more uh, which has more big, more uh, bigger distance than 350 kilometers. The entire charging infrastructure would require a doubling of the existing electricity network, and the implementation would take decades. Another disadvantage: the waiting times at the charging station are not technologically acceptable. So long waiting times do not have to be with our technology. For me, means freedom driving. When I get a telephone call, I have to be able to go into my car and to drive to any other city without any planning. This means freedom for me. And uh, once again, the question, is electric driving the future? Yes, there is no doubt that this is the case. To make this feasible, we have to use hydrogen, but to produce electricity during driving. Because with our technology, this is possible. There is no risk of explosion. We do not work with high pressure up to 800 bars like normal hydrogen cars. Our highest pressure is below 30 bars. We do not need no new petrol station because the conversion from diesel to methanol is on each fuel station is a cost of about 2,000 euro only. Transporting hydrogen is extremely energy intensive and has higher hazard classes than methanol. A hydrogen filling station costs between one to three million euro here in Germany. It must not be close to other buildings for explosion protection reasons. There is a law in Germany that the distance between residential buildings must be 100 meters to a fueling station of hydrogen and the distance between a normal filling station and the hydrogen must be 300 meters because of uh, danger. So now I want to come to our car, to the key facts and the parameters. Natalie, first edition. We can drive 820 kilometers. We will refuel the car within three minutes. Of course, this is a sporty car and we do have four-wheel drive and we get back the energy during braking that means we do have recuperation we have a 65 liter methanol fuel tank and 
In Germany, it is possible because of our highways. We can drive the cars a maximum speed of 300 kilometers per hour. Acceleration is like in a race car, 2.5 seconds to the, from zero to 100 kilometers per hour. And the total um, force of the car is uh, the horsepower is 400 kilowatt. And the energy capacity in the car is uh, the methanol and the battery itself. It is 190 kilowatt hours compared to comp competitor like Porsche. Uh, they do have maximum 80 kilowatt hours. That means we do have more than double of them. If the battery is dead empty, then our car is going 100 kilometers. We have driven, we have written here 120, but I would say 100 kilometers per hour without battery. So just with a fuel cell. Of course, uh, our car is a sporty car. It's a coupe with two seats. Later, maybe we can uh, add two children's seats. The surface uh, the, of the car is made by carbon. And uh, the vehicle frame, it is written on grill frame, maybe vehicle frame is a better expression, is uh, made by molybdene, uh, uh, chrome molybdene steel. And this is also good for races. So this car is fulfilling the racetrack regulations and you can just go with a number plate to the racetrack and compete against normal race cars. We have a, a aerodynamic from the underground and from the rear spoiler. And our dimensions, the car is about 4.4 meter length. The wide is two meters. High is 1.3 meter, so very low, and the maximum weight is 1,000 kilo. And then now, for the specialist under you, I will give even a closer look to our technical details. So we are ready to produce 500 cars within the next four years. That means we start next year and then the end of production will be 2004. The complete torque of the tar is more than 1000 Newton meter. That is really, really big, big amount. We have a voltage system of 400 volts and we calculated the average consumption with about 20 kilowatt hours. We can charge the complete car when the battery is completely empty within two hours. That means 22 hours coming from the electricity network and 15 kV coming from our fuel cell. Refueling with the methanol fuel tank within three minutes, I said already. And the re recuperation is nearly 100% up to deceleration of 0.3 meter per square second. Yes, uh, here we have written with the speed with the empty battery is 80, but I will correct this to 100 kilometers minimum per hour. The fuel uh, capacity of 65 liter methanol means 118 kilowatt hours in, in if I speak about electricity. The fuel cell power is up to 15 kilowatt. Battery capacity is between 60 and 70 kilowatt hours. And the battery, uh, to take the electricity out of the battery, we can use for a short time 450 kV. That means even if we have written 400 kilowatt, the next line for the all engines, we can use 450 kilowatt for uh, approximately 20 seconds to accelerate the car. The electric engines are maximum speed, the maximum revs of the um, engines are 12,000 revs per minute. And the first, uh, we have two gears. The first gear is going to 170 kilometers per hour. 
and the second gear is going up to 300 kilometers per hour. So, of course, uh, this uh, is a sport car, but it is just to show the future of hydrogen from a fuel cell is beyond question. And methanol is the carrier. Carrier is like a train for me. The crane takes goods and transporting them. For us, methanol is carrying the hydrogen and going to the fuel cell and just uh, bringing with the hydrogen electricity. So methanol is a perfect solution. And our vision for all vehicles in the future, if they are small or big, this is the future, this is our system, and we are working, and we are convinced this is the right way. We have built a lot of cars in the last time. We have built small cars, we have built big cars. Here's an example of a small car with a methanol reforming fuel cell. This is a working test vehicle from us. So we got this car from the German government. Uh, la, we finished this car last November. Sorry. That is normally <laughs> quiet. <laughs> We finished this car last November, November, and we're making endurance tests now since eight months. And this car is a very good example, being small or big. So I'm convinced that we can build cars from 40 horsepower up to a 40 ton trucks. And the fuel cell in this car is a small size, is a medium sized travel case. And of course, all these vehicles are emission free. This is the future without mineral oil. This small car shows once again, this is a city car, our vision, every car, small or big, this is built with our, can be built with, in, with our system. No problem at all. And uh, showing you where we are, we are in the south of Germany. We are coming from Bavaria. Um, we are ready to have the car for the future here in Ingolstadt. We can, we have a production line nearby Ingolstadt. We have orders from all over Europe. We expect the first vehicles delivered uh, next year, customers in the first half of 2001, 2021. And, um, of course, I have to say, we are discussing and going to the public a lot, but we had a lot, a lot of headwind coming from everywhere. So from the customers, from the politics, from normal people, uh, and uh, they don't believe us, they close their eyes, their ears, and we have to discuss and to discuss. So that means we need support from business and politics to bring this technology to a wider range. And I'm convinced with such a uh, webinar, webinar, webinar and uh, with su uh, such presentation, we are on the right way. I, I hope with your support, only with your support, we can be successful. We are on the right way. This is the future. And uh, thank you very much. I hope to see you very soon in the future somewhere. And uh, come to Ingolstadt. We can uh, drive a car. We have a, enough cars here. Make a small visit to us. And uh, yes, uh, uh, Corona is nearly over. Uh, hope to see you very soon and uh, follow my invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. So now we'll proceed to the Q&A session. We've been getting a lot of questions from everybody. Uh, what I'll ask is for our presenters to unmute themselves right now. Uh, but due to the technical issues that we're facing just now, uh, I'm going to start with Dr. John Shen uh, so we can go through some of your thoughts on uh, methanol fuel cell 
groups in um, China and Asia. So Dr. Dr. Shen, one of the questions that we got was uh, what are the main challenges that has to be addressed first before end consumers uh, can fully accept uh, the use of methanol fuel cells? I'm assuming in the um, automotive applications or perhaps maybe other applications, but maybe let's address the automotive one first. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, all good. Hello, oh, hi, yeah. So talking about uh, in China, I think that uh, uh, in China start with uh, in, uh, in the car, there's uh, uh, surely a good advantage because the uh, national infrastructure is uh, quickly built up in China, but uh, the problem is still of, of the cost. The national fuel cell cost is a big issue because in today's view, uh, the national fuel cell uh, compared to battery is at least uh, uh, triple or four times higher cost than battery. So that's the issue. Okay. So, but, we need, uh, uh, so sorry, carry on, please. Sorry. So we need. Um, volume manufacture so i mean the uh, big manuf volume manufacture should can reduce the cost and we already uh, calculate and uh, and uh, projected that if those uh, low material uh, production can be uh, mass produced and get the cost down quickly then the cost reduction can uh, realize the in china Okay. Um, so Dr. Shen, I think there's one question that uh, I would like to um, ask you and uh, I, I, would, I would probably ask the other presenters also. And that is, you know, in today's um, discussion about uh, fuel, the future, there are different kinds of fuels out there in the market. Uh, a question that we receive from the audience is, why, do we, why, why should you use methanol as compared to ammonia as a fuel? Uh, ammonia, in terms of uh, 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 ammonia, yeah, thanks. Uh, for a few, you first need to understand the, or, or need to know that uh, uh, a national wide view what kind of uh, fuel I'm backed by uh, government because there's a lot of choice, but uh, a government is a key uh, uh, factor to promote. And the national is already uh, it have 18 years uh, by government to promote as a uh, fuel for energy security and also for you know clean air. I mean those is is a, a policy really clearly uh, indicated by the government policy. And ammonia, I don't think there's any plan to build the infrastructure. Thanks, Dr. Shun. So next on, I'll go to Matt, and uh, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is, what is the efficiency of uh, the hydrogen electrolyzer and uh, methanol fuel cell? Uh, what is the complete cycle efficiency for both cases, including production, storage, transportation and uh, all the way to wheel? It's uh, quite a complex so, question. I know, uh, so, so basically uh, if, if you factor in all the elements between uh, using pure hydrogen in a compressed manner or even liquefied manner versus methanol, it's roughly the same around 22 to 25% system efficiency overall. Now, you can do this calculation in many ways, but this is uh, roughly the, the, the order of magnitude uh, you're talking about. So okay. you, you, will gain, you will gain, of course, some efficiency because you don't have to combine uh, carbon with, uh, with, with hydrogen. You just need to compress it, uh, but then you also need to, to transport it. 
So, um, so, so, so it's roughly the same uh, efficiency uh, in terms of the, the full cycle. Thanks, Matt. The next question, I'll, I'll try to combine two in one uh, due to the time limit. Uh, and that is, um, do you have any working prototypes in operation? Uh, I'm assuming this is your methanol fuel cells in uh, the automatic, automotive application. And, uh, and after that, uh, the question was, what is the lifespan of the HT uh, PEM fuel cell as well as the methanol reformer that you guys are using? Uh, so yes, uh, we are in in, in production, uh, not to scale at all. So uh, so we have started and we have uh, proven our, our sort of our core technology, but uh, we are still at an early stage in terms of production. So that's sort of one. And the lifespan. So for for passenger vehicles, it's uh, five to six thousand hours, which we can do, and we do that at a high power density. And for other applications, uh, we have different mechanisms to to reach uh, up to five or six times that lifetime, uh, which is needed in, in in the truck or the maritime area. Thanks, Matt. So the next question is an interesting one, uh, and I think this will go to both uh, Matt and Robert, uh, because this is a question that's addressing both your companies and your relevant technologies. So the question is, what is the difference between uh, blue wall and E1? Uh, how does blue wall convert methanol to H2 in the fuel cell? So I, I guess, Matt, you want to start first? Yes, I can. I can at least try. Well, I, I think there's many differences uh, between the companies. I think the main difference is that uh, that that we we do both high temperature PEM fuel cell stacks and methanol reformers, which we manufacture ourselves uh, and take to to market through partners. Uh, we do not do what uh, was explained about the proprietary cleanup. We, we don't use that because of the high temperature PEM. Whereas as, as Robert does, and and then you can take the rest. Certainly, uh, thank you, Mads. Yeah, I was I was going to kind of focus on the same areas here. So, uh, E1 technology, we're focused purely on converting the methanol water feedstock into fuel cell grade hydrogen, and then we can work with a variety of fuel cell uh, technology, low temperature PEM technologies in the marketplace, which is the dominant. Uh, PEM technology and particularly in the transportation and stationary power space, small scale. Um, and, and really the key to our technology to driving the, the low cost that's going to allow the adoption is how we're purifying uh, that hydrogen with our proprietary membrane technology. So it's an easy convert to, to crack the methanol, it's at low temperature, uh, and then we are able to purify it very inexpensively. Thanks, Robert. So a question that's kind of building up on what you just mentioned. Uh, this came from the audience and they were asking if you could elaborate slightly more about your hydrogen purifier. Uh, what type of technology does it utilize? Uh, does it involve precious metals? And uh, what sort of hydrogen purities are attainable? Certainly, thank you. So as I understand it, you're looking to know uh, just kind of generally that the makeup of the, of the technology and, and the use of precious metals. Um, so essentially, yes, we do. We use a uh, palladium membrane uh, foils uh, that, uh, that really our IP is around how you structure it so that you can get these uh, targeted 20,000 hour lifetimes out of the systems. It's really about how to get the long life without the breakthroughs of CO or CO2 in the system over the life of, the, of that purifier. And, um, and the second part of your question was what that, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't write that down. Don't worry. Uh, the second part was uh, with your with your uh, purifier. Uh, what sort of purities are we looking at oh, for you. hydrogen? Yeah. So typically, we're getting 99.99% pure hydrogen, and there's no measurable CO or CO2. As you know, or uh, people that are familiar with the PEM stacks, actually Ballard, when they had reforming technology, routinely ran their systems down to 99.9%. So long as there's no CO or CO2 and that stream, the fuel cell will run just fine. But for the greatest efficiency, you want to be at that upper level. And our systems, uh, when we deliver them, are typically at that 99.99% purity. Thanks, Robert. So the next question, uh, Robert, is, um, OK, I think this is, uh, why can't you use the recycled water that's produced uh, from your solution 
so that instead of using uh, a methanol and water blend, you're using pure methanol instead, and then you're just recycling and pumping the water back into the system. No, excellent question. And so it really depends on the application. Uh, for a truck-based solution, you're going to use a premix uh, just for space constraints and what you're trying to do. But as we're working on some of these marine projects um, where, you know, you're looking at megawatt scale power, we are going to take the water from the fuel cell and do a uh, and mix in, uh, in process of making the hydrogen. So we'll do the mixing uh, uh, in real time. Uh, to the uh, the fuel reformer, um, you still have to add a little bit of water. It's not a it's not a direct one to one, but uh, it can be very close. And we have the technology to do that as well. Thanks, Robert. Uh, the next question, uh, oh, it's another question for Blue Wall and E1. Um, so the question is, how are uh, your companies trying to overcome the heat up time associated with methanol reformers for vehicle applications? Uh, you can go first. That's fine. <laughs> I, was, I was offering it to you. Um, certainly. So for, for my application, you know, we're not really focused on the, the car application because that is that is the challenge is that there's a lot of metal mass that you have to keep be kept hot. And so for our applications, you're, whether you're dealing with trucks, you're dealing with fleets, you know, where you're leaving and coming back to the same location. So when we're in operation uh we're creating our own heat necessary for the chemical reaction but at the end of the day you go back to the bus barn or the fleet uh the, the fleet warehouse and you're just going to plug it in uh, to keep it hot using a very very low amount of grid power to, to maintain that system and also it cools down very very slowly you can go a number of hours without needing any kind of uh power external power to keep the system hot and then uh, you go up into the larger applications, and those are typically 24/7. Uh, whether you're talking about trains or marine vessels, they're they're always on. So that's uh, that's not necessarily a challenge in that market. Uh, yeah, and uh, so 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 the 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 difference is on the 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 high temperature PEM plus reformer systems. Uh, you do have a from cold fast startup time of these five to ten minutes. And I mean, we would never go any slow or any faster than that due to the effects of the battery pack. So we are basically relying on this hybridization strategy, which has many good effects on the side of just the startup aspect. So, so that's how we are dealing with that. And uh, yeah. Thanks, Matt. Next question, uh, Roland. So this is for you. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the advantage of using methanol in a fuel cell rather than an internal combustion engine? Because the internal combustion engine can uh, be readily modified to take on methanol as a fuel also. Yeah, if you have a combustion engine, you burn it and then you have a lot of pollution. Maybe the CO, uh, CO dioxide is 20% less but still you burn it and you have uh, all the burnt uh, parts in, in the pollution. With uh, our methanol hydrogen fuel cell, you have no any pollution, it is clean. And that's the uh, main thing here in Germany, you have to have a clean car. Even the battery cars now, they are not clean uh, because uh, they get the electricity out of uh, carbon, um, production electricity companies but uh, in our case we do have no pollution we do not have nox uh, we nothing have so it's just uh, pollution free and that's the future thanks roland the next question is uh for i mean for roland also but uh i think this this is uh it points towards your your business model trying to understand how you intend to roll out your cars uh, because they're, they're, they're ready for manufacturing right now. And once they hit the, the consumer market, how the consumers are expecting to refuel their vehicles uh, when you can't get methanol at a pump station or a petrol station right now? As I said already, uh, to convert a normal diesel pump to a um, methanol fuel pump is about 1,500 to 2,000 euros. And uh, we will buy or meet uh, or rent a fuel pump from a freeze station on, owner 
uh, for about 3,000 euro per month. And then we will convert this diesel pump to methanol fuel pump. So each customer who has uh, gotten uh, Natalie, he will have also his own fuel uh, methanol fuel pump in his town. And if he is living on a small village, then we will deliver free of charge the first year the methanol to, uh, to him. And later on, it will be a snowball effect, and then, of course, it will go by itself. Thanks, Roland. So, I, uh, I think uh, the next part, I'll, I'll come back to you, Dr. Shin, uh, so we can, we can um, ask you a bit about what you think about Asia. I mean, beyond, beyond just China, I think China is very well established in terms of uh, using methanol in different applications. Uh, it's widely available. If uh, Roland were to roll out his business in China, I don't think his consumers would have a problem with finding a pump station if they are in the right province to, to, to refuel their vehicles. But outside of China, uh, Dr. John, do you, do you, do you see um, that kind of potential for uh, methanol fuel cells to be taken up in, in, in say, for example, cars or, or land transport vehicles? Uh, in Asia, I travel a lot in Singapore, Malaysia, and uh, also India, all those. I found a, a particular application is uh, that the backup, backup power supply, backup for generator power. And because uh, uh, there's a lot of island, there's no good uh, uh, rate supply the power. So there's a lot of blackout happens. So I think that the uh, backup power is a, a, a good market. And uh, like uh, there are a lot of Indian people contacts to ask us to supply those back power for the telecom and uh, also as a uh, uh, sensitive area they needed to continue run the equipment. And uh, there's a good project actually we 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 contacted and talked about in S Singapore is elevator back power. And at that time, we ha don't have the methanol fuel cell. We have only uh, hydrogen bottle fuel cell, just the pure hydrogen. At that, that time, because the safety issue, all those things, we could not uh, continue. But right now, I think it's good, good, good uh, time to do some tests in Singapore. And because of the corona, I will have to study it, but uh, we plan so use uh, methanol fuse as a backup power for elevator that's uh, we did quite a lot of market study and I also talked about government and uh, i think it's quite interesting thanks dr john so the next question uh I, i'll post this both to blue ball and, and e1 again um and that was during the during your presentations i think we touched about we touched upon lower emissions or zero emissions, for example. Uh, could you clarify, uh, maybe let's start with Matt. Uh, what are we looking at with uh, your fuel cell, like in terms of emission profile and how that is aligned with, say, for example, the Paris Agreement or uh, uh, national ambitions to lower uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Um, yes, well, well, that's where normally you, you try to combine both uh, uh, you could say environmental and cli climatic emissions, um, but but uh, this is pretty much separate. So from the tailpipe, you have nothing except CO2. So CO2 is the only thing coming out of the tailpipe that is harmful. And uh, I would say CO2 is harmful for the environment, but not for the person as such. So when we're talking the climate uh, accords and reaching the decarbonization, it's not about what comes out of the exhaust. It's where do you get your fuel from? As, as, as Roland mentioned, if you get your electricity from a coal power plant in Germany, it doesn't make sense. So it, the aspect of where you get the power from is what will determine how we can reduce our CO2 footprint. Now, when it comes to, 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 to particle emissions and other stuff that comes out of the tailpipe that is bad for people, there is absolutely zero. We measure our emissions based on the WHO, uh, the World Health Organization standards for breathable working air or breathable air in a working environment. So, so that's sort of how we, we, we frame this. And I would say no vehicle 
ele battery electric hydrogen methanol fuel cell or other will make sense if you use fossil fuels to power it. Thanks, Max. Robert? Yeah, so the, you know, currently where our technology is being adopted is in markets where pollution is really the issue. So think of China, think of India, uh, markets like that, uh, that, you know, we're engaged in demonstrations of these other other parts of the world that are adopting fuel cells. And the question is, how do you get to this zero emission solution? And it's really about the availability of renewable uh, or green methanol in the marketplace. Uh, it is produced in small quantities by a number of providers, but it's mostly being shipped to Europe as a fuel additive uh, in that market. And so for currently in the demonstrations we're doing like in the States, we talk about um, that it has a renewable future, but until there's demand for renewable methanol, I can't actually have, have uh, my customers acquire it in small company, uh, excuse me, in, in small quantities. So really, we need to have larger quantities because it's not a technology issue about renewable methanol. It's really a demand issue and why we're in this kind of this intermediate phase where we're just kind of piloting and demonstrating the technology. There's not enough demand for do the factories. But we're also engaged with a number of companies that are coming on with some very significant uh, renewable methanol plants here in the near future over the next couple of years that I should be able to start directing our customers to and achieving this zero emission goal that is really that the focus worldwide. Thanks, Robin. So I've got a question for Roland here. Uh, let me try to find it. Uh, this is a really interesting one. So <laughs> and I think this is quite interesting for me also. Um, as an end consumer, how can we help you? How can we help you bring this technology to market in such a way that we can buy it at a cost that uh, is uh, comfortable with our wallets? Of course, um, we have a spot car. And uh, as I said, uh, we can even be on the racetrack. We have a cage, we have everything in the car. So it's really a, a collector car. We will produce 500 pieces and each piece cost uh, um, 407,000 euro. So that's a really big amount. But if you go to the competitor, uh, the Porsche, for example, it is also available now for, let me say, I have 200 to 250,000 euro with some equipment. And uh, uh, we are a little bit more expensive, we, but with our car, you have not the danger to stop on the highway. Eh? So you can continue, you have a range of 820 kilometers, uh, you will go to a refueling station, you have a pit stop for three minutes and then you can continue. This will not happen with a real battery car like the Porsche. And this is now the new future, the new, our vision for the future for everybody. Also for the small car, as I said, 40 horsepower car, uh, like we did it with a Polo, with a Smart. So this is uh, for everybody, the system which will work without pollution. Thanks, Roland. So I think uh, that leads us to the end of today's uh, webinar. I, am, uh, I do apologize for people who have uh, sent in your questions, but we did not have the time to answer them. Uh, what I'll do is I do have a list of the questions that were sent in today. I'm going to send it around the presenters and uh, after the webinar, what they could do is probably um, email your, 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 uh, your responses to you. So uh, once again, I would like to thank my presenters, everybody who came on board today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your presentations. Uh, and thank you um, participants for coming on the webinar today. Uh, this is a um, the second webinar in a series of webinars is hosted by the Methanol Institute. Uh, we will be announcing the third webinar that which should which should come out um, sometime at the end of next month. So uh, do look out for that. Uh, if not, thank you everybody and uh, have a good day to you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Okay.